coming to church on Sunday mornings. I love seeing all you folks and uh, love the uh, encouragement that we get here every Sunday. And uh, today has been uh, an unusual blessing. Philippians chapter 4 in your Bibles as we're getting close to wrapping up Philippians. And as Derek has said, we're about to move into Daniel. <clears throat> And I love Daniel. <clears throat> Did you know the book of Daniel? That Daniel had predicted with pinpoint accuracy the very day when Jesus Christ would be crucified. And he did that 600 years before he was born. If there's anything in the Bible that invokes faith in believing that the Bible is the Word of God, Daniel does that. Daniel does that. And the, the stories of, in Daniel, the Bible stories, are just uh, so encouraging and so powerful. And uh, so we're going to enjoy that together with a Western theme built in. You'll see Matt Dillon, Festus Hagen, and all the great cowboys of the past and a few of the videos that we'll be sharing with you to illustrate points. So we're looking forward to that. It's going to be a great time, great time together. Today's message is content in Christ, content in Christ. And uh, it's Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. And uh, Charlene Imholtz, I don't see Charlene here this morning, uh, so that means her and Dinah Childs are watching online Last week, 160-something folks were online from start to finish, and, and uh, we just are so thankful for this ministry. And so, Charlene, I know you're going to try to be here today, but we're just going to kind of reach out to folks that, that uh, are online to remind you that we don't forget you during the message. We're, we're always thankful for you. Coach called my brother-in-law, Kenny Cole, this week down in Bologna. And Kenny is one of the heroes in my life. He was a Vietnam veteran. He's married to my sister, Susan. And uh, cowboy, um, I mean, just a, a, an amazing football player and just a great guy and a, a great dad and a great husband. And um, so uh, he, uh, he just was so astounded that Coach had called him. And I was so blessed by that. So we're thankful for our online ministries and we love you guys that are there online that can't be here with us how many remember tommy lasorda oh a lot of you know tommy coached the uh colorful character coached the los angeles dodgers to two world series championships he made a comment about contentment i recorded it it's only 23 seconds long so listen carefully and make sure my volume is up here on my phone uh yeah there we go and uh, listen carefully what Tommy Lasorda said about this word, contentment. Well, it's playing, but it's not, re not saying anything. Let me try that one more time. Aha, I'm playing the wrong one, I think. There we go. If I'd played the right one, it would work. Here we go. Here we go. Did you hear that? How many of you remember the Carnation milk can? Contented cows give better milk. All right. And he went on to say, and I believe that contented people give better performance in life. Contentment is a valuable thing to possess. And yet it seems to be something very elusive in our society today. Well, we're, we're going to focus today on how to have contentment. And I hope this is encouraging to you. Because we're going to hit on some very specific subjects 
that I know are of concern to you as we look through the Bible today and analyze the scripture together. So Philippians chapter 4 verse 10, would you all stand together one more time uh, in honor of the reading of the word of God. Philippians chapter 4 verse 10, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am in. Wow. Have we learned that lesson, to be content in whatever circumstances we are in. I know how to get along with humble means, and also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, look at that, in any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You may be seated. I received an interesting phone call yesterday, and it was one of those pivotal moments in life. Uh, I wish you could have driven by my driveway, but standing out there with my snow boots on, my shorts, and a water hose, <laughs> washing mud off the driveway. <laughs> you can picture that, can't you? Phone rang, and it was our youngest son, Joseph, and um, he called, and he was uh, really concerned, upset uh, about this spy balloon that had come across the United States. And he, he wanted to talk about that. Now, look, Joseph is uh, 40 years old. He has three little girls. Uh, and uh, let me make sure I get this right. Eight five, and two, nearly three. And he's at that stage of life where he's, you know, a lot of us who have lived the majority of our life, how many of you feel like you probably have lived the majority of your life? Would you raise your hands? Okay. A lot of, a lot of the people in this room. But remember your 20-year commitment, you can't die till we get through the Bible. Now, by doing Wednesday nights, we believe we have shortened that somewhat, and, and we may be able to get you through it in like 16 or 17 years, but remember, you got to hang on, okay? And so um, Joseph probably looks at life differently than a lot of the people in this room, but we have some young couples here with small children here today. And you look at your children and you wonder what kind of world, and all of you look at your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren, and you wonder what kind of a world are they going to inherit? Uh, what, what's going to happen? How, things seem to be uh, disintegrating very, very rapidly around us. So we talked about the spy balloon some, and we talked about the border, and we talked about uh, inflation, and, and, and we talked about corruption in politics. We talked about all that. And then I said, but you know what, Joseph? i got to tell you something. All that is the surface. Politics are not the problem. The problem is what we believe as a nation. That's the problem. Gary, what you were alluding to, you had no idea I was going to say all this, did you? But the problem is people's view of the world or their world view. And so we can fight battles and be angry and upset about politics uh, until the cows come home. But it doesn't make any difference if you're a Republican or a Democrat. If your worldview is wrong, you will never have contentment and security. Are you with me? If your worldview is wrong. So that's the, that's the basic problem of the discontent in our society today is that people don't have the peace of God that passes all understanding. And there are reasons for that. There are reasons why people cannot say what Paul just said, in any and every circumstance, 
I've learned to be content. There are reasons for that. Now, Joseph and I reached a conclusion yesterday in that conversation, which was bottom line, and this is a conclusion that you can share with your children and your grandchildren, and, and this conclusion is what is the answer for the United States of America and what is the answer for the world. What I'm about to share with you. So we continued on, and, and, and we were talking about things, and, and I said, now, Joseph, here's the, here's the problem. Here's the problem we have as a society. In 1859, Charles Darwin published, 1859, published his book on the origin of species. So they were talking about Darwinism and the theory of evolution during the Civil War, when a lot of the modern scientific methods and tools that we have today were certainly not in existence during the Civil War. It's that old. 120 years after the publishing of On the Origin of the Species by Charles Darwin, uh, a, a large gathering of the world's most prominent evolutionists took place in Chicago, Illinois in 1986. And they came from all over the world. It was called the Chicago uh, Morphology and Anthropology Seminar. And one of the most prominent theologians or, or, or evolutionists in the world got up to speak, and he asked this vast array of people from many different countries. I want to ask you here to be honest and can you stand up and tell us one thing that we have scientifically learned to be absolutely true about the theory of evolution since Darwin published his book and he was greeted with total silence. One man stood up and here's what he said. We have learned that it ought not to be taught in high school. Now, why is this important? How does it relate to the mindset of Americans today? It's like it's a given. If you don't believe in the theory of evolution, then you are a Bible thumping fundamental idiot if you don't believe in it. And basically, people just accept the fact that it's a proven concept. And yet, my friend, I, I, I can say to you, after having read numerous books and listened to numerous debates and studied this thing somewhat intensely, I was involved with the group, Jack Fortner. Uh, you may have heard about this, is before you got back to Arkansas. We passed a law in Arkansas that made the teaching of evolution and back in 1982, the teaching of evolution illegal unless they taught the, 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 the concepts of creation alongside the theory of evolution to give children a choice in their minds so they could, they could learn. We had a big trial in Little Rock over it. It was a, it was a pretty amazing thing to, to uh, see what all happened with that. But I can tell you this, that uh, the problem with teaching children that they're here by chance, they're here by accident, they are here by random selection, uh, they are here without the existence of a creator, is that you're spinning them off into a psychological existence where there are no foundational truths in their life. Everything is by chance. Everything is by circumstance. So the theory of evolution formed the basis for Adolf Hitler and his super race because he believed that there was a super race of people evolving and if he didn't extricate, extricate bloodlines from society, then those bloodlines would continue to be polluted and the super race would never be able to ascend and accomplish the things that human beings could accomplish. 
And, and so it's, it's why we had Auschwitz and Dow Call and, and World War II. It was the theory of evolution. The Communist Party of China believes in the theory of evolution. Communism is based on, on the fact that, as they say, there is no God. When W.O. Vault, pastor at Emmanuel Baptist Church, went to Russia and visited their elementary schools, he stood there as they began their day by standing and reciting this three ways, three times. There is no God. There is no God. There is no God. And that's how they start school in Russia. And that's what they're taught in China. And tragically... Tragically, that's what we're teaching our children. We teach them that they have descended from the apes. I liked one debate that took place where one theologian and one evolutionist were talking, and the theologian paused and said, and this was, pro- this was not very scientific and probably not appropriate, but he said, Sir, were you related to the apes on your mother's side or your father's side? So we were all like, we feel like we've been violated with a balloon coming over the United States and what are we going to do? And we knew it was, we knew when it was launched in China. We knew it was coming across the Pacific Ocean. Uh, We knew that it was uh, up in the Aleutian Islands. We knew it was coming down through the United States. And, And so we were all like, what in the world is going on? And you watch the news and you see these horrific things that are happening and it sows the seeds of discontent in our hearts and our minds how do you live when you believe there is no god how shall we then live if we believe that this is all a chance happening well i'll tell you how you live you believe that the planet is all you've got and so you do whatever's necessary to protect the planet. And you tell people they can't drive gasoline cars and they can't drill for oil and they, they can't drill for natural gas and they can't have coal plants. And, 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 they, and, and you know what? If you don't agree to do it, we're going to force you to do it. We're going to force you to preserve this planet. Why? Because in that worldview, this is all there is. So you can understand, it's too, this is why Christianity finds itself cross-culture. This is why Christianity finds itself as being the enemies of those. We're not, we don't, we love people. We want everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. But we're looked upon as enemies. And we're looked upon as people who are stopping the progress of society. Because we do believe that God has a plan for this world. But this world will not be eternal. This world is going to be changed by the power of God. And everything that we have here is going to be consumed, as Peter says, with, with fire from heaven. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Dave, you're teaching all that right now in Revelation. But my friend, listen. This gets down to the basics, you know. Quit debating about, should I be a Democrat or a Republican? No, let me tell you what you should debate about. Do I believe there is a God, or do I believe there's not a God? Do I believe that I am responsible to a holy God, or do I believe that somehow, some way, we just got to make it through long enough to get to the next group of people? I mean, it's all so sad, so sad. How do people live who don't know God? Um, We grieve with those who grieve and rejoice with those who rejoice. And Lewis and Jana will tell you, talk to Lewis Friday night, knowing, Lewis said at Brant's funeral, I know where he is. And David Johnson said something that really helped the family. Temporary is a key word. He said, this is temporary. He said, you're going to see 
brand again because we know where he is. And God confirmed that to Jana in a powerful way. A powerful way. But you know what they have? They have faith in God. Now, take that out of the situation and where are you today? Where are we today without that? That this is all there is and, and when you die, you're like an animal, you're dead and there's nothing more. Oh, this is why people are so discontented and they don't even know it. They're always searching for something that only God can fulfill. Only God can satisfy the need of a hungry soul. Only God can give us contentment. Only God can give us peace. Only God can feel that hunger in our heart. Only God. That's what Paul's saying in this scripture. You know, the people he was ministering to held the emperor as God. They, they held uh, the, the Greek uh, gods, the pantheon, as being their gods. They had superstitions. They had all kinds of religions. And what Paul was saying is, look, to know the true and living God will give you contentment. It will give you peace in a very, very troubled world. My friend, this world is troubled. This world's on edge. And we see the Chinese military building, and we see what's happening in Russia and Ukraine, and we're trying to figure this world out. Can I tell you something? In his hand, there is safety. Amen? In his hand, there is safety. And that's the only place you're going to find contentment, is being in the hand of God. In the hand of God. So Joseph and I reached a conclusion. He said, Dan, what, what can I do? What can I do? It's a very simple conclusion. And it's one for all of you and for me and for all of us to implement in our life. Do you feel powerless when you see this stuff? Do you feel like there's nothing we can do about all this. Oh, no, wait. There is something you can do about it. Over in the Hope Center this week, and I think next week, we're going to be back in the children's uh, church room. I think next week or the following week. But right now, Joey and Sarah Bailey, we're glad to have Sarah's brother here today. Would you stand up? He's one of our military guys. He's home. God bless you, young man, for serving in our military. They're over there teaching the children Bible stories. They're over there teaching them to believe in God. They're over there teaching them to believe in the Bible and to honor God. Here was the conclusion Joseph and I reached yesterday. The conclusion is this. Make sure that the three Bailey girls, Julia, Josie, and Jenna Ray, are in church every Sunday learning the Bible reinforce it at home, and that's what you can do about it. Amen? And I said, and if you don't do that, you got no right to complain. Me and Joseph are close, like all my other two sons, Andrew and Benjamin, we're all close. So we can, I said, Joseph, I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, he, he and Jeannie do a great job, and Benji and Sarah raising our five granddaughters. I don't know what we'd do without our family, but, but I'm going to tell you, that's the only hope, my friend, for society. Next generation ministries, what can we do about this? We can teach our children and get grandchildren the truth that we are here by the created hand of God, and God is in control and no matter what the circumstances of our life, he has this thing covered. He work, is working all things together for our good. We don't have to panic. We don't have to live in fear. We're no longer slaves to fear. We are a child of God. Amen? We don't have to live in fear. We don't live in uncertainty. We can do something about it. 
Let's build greater Sunday schools, and let's build greater children's ministries, and let's build greater youth ministries, and let's teach our children, most importantly, at home, and every chance that we get to know God, to know God, and let's use our time with them so that they will know how to be content in Christ. Now, I've used the majority of my time for the introduction. So put your seatbelt on, and here we go. I do this periodically. <clears throat> Ready, Robbie? Limber your, limber your finger up up there to hit these buttons. Here we go. Got your sermon notes? Realizing and accepting that God will providentially control and provide for us through any circumstance is critical to contentment. Ruminate on that one. <laughs> Man, <laughs> meditate on that one. You realize it and you accept it. You know it and you accept it as being true, and you yield to it. You know, you accept, you yield. God, God allows for every contingency. Do you believe this? Look at that. God allows for every contingency, every decision, circumstance, or act, and weaves his perfect will through those events. The Chinese spy balloon did not take God, uh, like, oh, what are they doing now? He wasn't surprised. And every little thing that happens in our life. You have to turn around and go home because you forgot something. Oh, it's such an aggravating thing. You ever do that? Have you ever done it twice? <laughs> oh, this is so aggravating. I was making progress. I don't think it bothers women as bad as men. Because men always want to be making progress. We've got to get to the goal. We've got to get to the goal. We've got to get to the finish line. Honey, I forgot my cell phone. Oh, can you live without it? No. <laughs> that ever happened to any of y'all? Huh? Okay. <laughs> so every little circumstance, it may seem like a detour. It may seem like uh, something that is an anomaly. Hey, are you closed-minded or are you open-minded? Turn to the person next to you and say, I want to be an open-minded person. I want to be. I really want to be. <clears throat> Whether you are open-minded or closed-minded depends on how you respond to, listen to this word. Are you ready? Anomalies. Anomalies. Are you ready for that word? Anomalies. And some of you thought that was your husband's junior high girlfriend, anomaly, but that wasn't, that's not what that is, okay. How you respond to anomalies is a good indicator of your open-mindedness. Anomalies are like a glitch in the matrix. You can identify these moments when you find something surprising, missing, or strange. Does that not happen to us every day? We find something surprising, we find something strange, and we always find something missing, don't we? I put something, you know how your, your car, you, you, you got, uh, a lot of them have these things, you can raise it up and there's your tools to change your, your, your uh, tire. I raised mine up the other day and I've put something in there that was very important. And I was out there washing my driveway off yesterday and I thought, you know, I put something in there, but for the life of me, I can't remember what I put in there. <laughs> but I didn't take the time to go check it out. I'm going to do that this afternoon. Evidently something I can live without for the time being. Do you ever miss anything? Where did I put that? What happened? Okay, how you respond to changes in your plans, basically. Anomalies indicate that the world doesn't work the way you thought it did. These moments can be worth their weight in gold if you pay attention. Closed-minded people tend to ignore or gloss over anomalies. Open-minded people want to dive in and understand. That's you. That's why you're in church. Because my name is Sam Anomaly Bailey. Of course, diving in is as hard as it may require you to discard your ideas and beliefs. See, that's the problem in our society when everybody's arguing is because nobody can be open-minded anymore. It's my way or the highway. This is the problem in churches. 
Now, folks, let me just say this to you. Praise God for the peace and the harmony and the unity of this church. We are not going to argue and fight in here over things that don't matter when the world is decaying and going to hell. We're not going to do that. We can't afford to do that. Okay? And, and, and to be open-minded means that, you know what? You may be right and you may be wrong about something, but you've got to have an open mind about it. And say, okay, God, I didn't plan on this, but every person in the Bible I see that's listed as a great hero of the faith is somebody who dealt with an anomaly in their life and dealt with it by faith. And they pleased God when they did it. Noah had the anomaly of the ark, building a boat on dry ground where it had never rained for 120 years. Would you call that an anomaly? Abraham dealt with the anomaly of God saying, leave home. Where do you want me to go, Lord? Just keep walking. Just keep walking. Joseph dealt with the anomaly of prison. 17 years old, sold into slavery. And then into prison he went. After he did the right thing in Potiphar's house, he was thrown in prison for doing the right thing. I'd call that an, an, an anomaly, wouldn't you? Daniel dealt with the anomaly of the lion's den. That's strange, isn't it? You find yourself surrounded by lions who are just grinning at you. <laughs> and they can't even open their jaws. Moses dealt with the anomaly of the Red Sea. He split the sea and we walked right through it. Our fears are drowned in perfect love. That was something different. Joshua dealt with the anomaly of Jericho. Don't try to breach the city walls. Walk around it, blow your trumpets, and crash your, crash your lanterns, and the walls will fall down. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Gideons, right? Did you hear that? <laughs> That's an anomaly. David dealt with the anomaly of Goliath. Little boy, teenage boy out there with this trained warrior. Eight foot tall or taller. And uh, all of these people dealt with these things, these changes in life, these circumstances in life through faith. And my friend, that's what it requires us to do. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And we hang on to that scripture, don't we? Man, oh man, oh man, do we ever. If you keep silent this time, uh, uh, Mordecai told his, his uh, niece Esther, if you keep silent at this time, liberation and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place. But you and your father's house will be destroyed. Who knows, perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. My friend, she was under a lot of pressure. Esther was. And she operated by faith in this anomaly of her life. And God worked through her. And if we will do the same thing, God will work through us to work miracles. Now Paul's going to talk about money. And that's something we're all interested in. And he said, those who love money, Ecclesiastes said, who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. You're not going to find contentment by having more things. But godliness with contentment is a great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves through with many pains. Now, money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is. The question is, what do you want to do with the money that God gives you? Do you want to bless people and do the work of God? Or, you know, we had a guy in our church years ago, and our senior adult ministry building is named after him, the Macon Bennett Center. And Macon had a saying. He said, he said, Sam, you know what most people want to do? 
the safe here is to remind us that we need to have a secure mind. He said, Sam, most people want to get all they can, can all they get, and then sit on the can. <laughs> get all they can, can all they get, and sit on the can. Thinking that sitting on that can will bring them security and contentment. It just doesn't do that. Not according to the Word of God. A follower of Christ can find contentment regardless of circumstantial conditions. That is the security of their unified joy. Jeremiah Burroughs said aptly, Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely su submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal of every condition. Christian contentment is based on confidence in God's providential care. Now God took care of of Paul by sending a offering through Epaphroditus to him in prison uh, and and he was writing back to the Philippians and he rejoiced because not because he got the gift but because it was an expression of their love and partnership in the gospel his attitude reveals his patient trust in God to take care of things do we have that patient trust in God God you're gonna you got this you're gonna take care of it I'm not going to freak out. I'm not going to go crazy. I'm not going to worry. I'm going to trust you. Mm, that's hard to do, isn't it? Do you find that hard to do? Does worry creep up over you and, and like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, you wish you hadn't woken up because you can't go back to sleep because you're worried about something? Uh, do we really put God's business first? If we do put God business first, we can be confident that no matter the circumstances, God will cause all things to work together for our good and for his glory. Christian contentment is revealed by adapting to changing circumstances. We've confused the definitions between true needs and felt needs. He who dies with the most toys wins. You ever seen that bumper sticker? That, you ever seen that philosophy of life? Oh, no, no, no. There are True needs and there are felt needs. And I tell you, marketing on television and other places makes our felt needs out of touch with our true needs, right? Our ultimate purpose is not ourselves and our selfish satisfaction. God created us to glorify him and enjoy him from all eternity. That is the purpose of our existence. And if you have a worldview that says I'm here by accident, there is no God, you'll not find the joy and the liberty and the life and the pursuit of happiness that even our founding fathers tried to write into the uh, Constitution. That we might have the opportunity for the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <coughs> we only find that in the context of our faith in God. Contentment is not based on circumstances. More stuff won't bring lasting satisfaction and less stuff won't either. You can be a monk... Or you can be uh, Elon Musk. I guess, I guess that's probably the two extremes, right? Monk to Musk. <laughs> and if you don't have God anywhere in between, you will not have contentment. For our present troubles are quite small and won't last very long. Now let's read this one together, okay? Can you do this? Let's read it out loud together. Ready? For our present troubles are quite small and won't last very long. Can anybody say Amen. Okay, let's keep going. Yet they will produce for us an immeasurably great glory that will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see right now. Rather, we look forward to what we have not yet seen. For the troubles we see will soon be over, but the joys to come will last forever. Can somebody say glory, hallelujah, amen? Thank God for that. A follower of Christ knows that even troubling circumstances are opportunities for God to make us better and stronger. Dear brothers and sisters, whenever trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. Boy, that's counter thinking to griping and complaining and murmuring. God, why did you let this happen? Hey, Bob and Dee, welcome. You had to get down here, didn't you? You had to get here with a spout where the glory comes out. Good to see y'all. We've already talked about you today. For when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. 
When your endurance is fully developed, you'll be strong in character and ready for everything. Wow. We're training, folks. We're in training. We're, we're getting ready when we go through these problems in life. Contentment is learned by experience. It's learned through the exposure to the times of need and the times of plenty, Francis Chan says. And finally, Christian contentment is empowered by Christ. Now, I love Tim Tebow. Remember, I was talking to you about my relationship with Joseph, and Joseph called me the other day. He said, hey, I just committed Twin Lakes Baptist Church to do something. I said, really? What did you commit us to do? He said, you're going to be hosting Tim Tebow. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> he said, I, I got on the line, and uh, I emailed his people and said, we want Tim Tebow to come to Twin Lakes Baptist Church. And, and, and he said, and I'm, and I'm tempting him to get him in with a trout fishing trip with Dwayne Hayda. So he, he committed you too. <laughs> He's a wild man. I think he got something from his daddy. But anyway, <laughs> so we'll see where that one goes. And I remember that was, y'all remember that was Tim's life verse. Uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. A lot of athletes have claimed that as their life verse and their motivational verse. A lot of you have as well. It's a great verse. But you know, literally, what he is saying here, look, this literally reads, I can do all this through Christ. Now look, I love to play basketball, but I can never dunk it. How many of you could dunk a basketball? Let me see your hands. <laughs> Three people in here said they could dunk a basketball. Three people claim they can dunk a basketball. Now, let me tell you something. That's the difference between a white church and a black church right there. I'm telling you. White men can't jump, can we? Can't jump very well. <laughs> can you dunk a basketball? But you, I can say this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and I'll run, and I'll jump, and I might touch the bottom of the net. See, we take a verse out of context and... What Paul was saying was, I can have contentment whether I'm hungry or whether I've had a great meal, whether I've got plenty of money or no money. I can have contentment if I'm cold and in a desperate situation or if I'm in the Holiday Inn Express. I, I can have comfort anywhere, anytime, any place, any situation. I can do all that through Christ who strengthens me to do it. Now there you have it. Because, you know, we really set people up for failure when we say claim this verse and go dunk a basketball and then we can't even get off the ground. So then who do we say failed us? Well, Christ failed me. Because I, I took the verse and Christ failed me. So we set people up for failure when we misinterpret that verse. So Paul said we can do this. We can have contentment in all these circumstances. It's a promise that as we put God's kingdom first... As we work together to advance the gospel, God will equip us to deal with whatever circumstances we're doing that in. I myself no longer live. Let's read it together. Here we go, one more time. Matter of fact, let's stand together and let's prepare for the invitation. Um, let's read this together. I myself no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So I live my life in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Folks, uh, the secret of successful living, contentment and peace. You don't need stuff to be content if you're content with having Jesus. Christian contentment is about believing Christ is enough. You don't need Jesus plus something. Don't be preoccupied with the situation. Be preoccupied with the Savior. That's the secret. Let's bow our heads for prayer.